Welcome. This is the July 18th Rehive Production User Call. We have Andrew, Eric, Jan, Daniel, Santiago, and myself, Michael. And mm -hmm. welcome, Eric. I understand you heard about this from Discord. Could you first uh, describe briefly what the presence is on Discord and tell us about yourself? Yeah, I am very much a hobbyist. Uh, and given the, the, the discussion I've heard so far, it sounds like this is some low level stuff, which is where I want, I really have an interest in, in systems programming and moving in that direction. But um, like my intro to FreeBSD and Beehive is I just got, I wanted to move from cloud stuff, AWS and GCP to having my own dedicated machine. So I got one on high velocity and uh, put FreeBSD on it and don't know what I'm doing. Uh, I want to run some VMs on there. And then Beehive, I hear good things about it. So figured I'd be a fly on the uh, on the proverbial wall. Cool. Uh, tell us about, was it high velocity? What is that? Just a dedicated hosting provider, um, kind of like link Vulture or okay. um, what, what's the other, OVH Cloud. But um, I, like along those lines, I'm actually, I just got my own uh, Power Edge and I'm going to try co-location, put FreeBSD on like literally my own hardware and put that somewhere. And does this tie to your work or simply your uh, recovery from work each day? Uh, yeah, more, more that okay. recovery from work. Cool. This this is the fun stuff. Cool. All right. well, welcome. Yes, go ahead, Jan. Before you wreck that shit, um, make sure to uh, put a little uh, board, I don't know, Microtech router, the Raspberry Pi, in there as a VPN service for your uh, out of bound management. If you're going with just one gig uh, the ports in the colocation, the nice thing is that a microtech uh, switch uh, can be easily powered off your server and also has enough spare CPU cycles because the switching is done in hardware to uh, also act as WireGuard VPN. That's, it's that's a bit good janky, to hear. But, I was looking uh, at those yesterday. I was looking at Microtix last night. Uh, I actually have a couple small ones in my house. It's the least thinking. bad option I know of. No, Malachi. Malachi. That's Latvian for micro, you know, from, you know, related to Microtech. Uh, that's a Latvian company. I've seen him being built and other co-founders. Uh, yes, power from the server. Uh, use it for, how would you power from, from the server, Jan? You're talking over like just USB power out the back, like the, this little thing going or what? Yeah, That'll that one is power. just 100 megabits. Yep, okay. But then your ones which should have a five volt input. In that case, uh, if you are feel it, if your host allows it uh, to be racked after you tinker with it, it's probably easiest to steal 200 milliamps from the um, five volt standby rail. Um, Got it. Cool. I think I've seen a Racket uh, um, PCB even to just uh, put it in a PCIe card so that you uh, can tap it there. But oh, Jan, you have that Microtech PCI card, correct? And would that do the job, or you can't kind of have the mm, yeah, yeah, no, because uh, when you have well, it works as long as you have power on, as in twelve volt power. Yep, yep. Uh, so the server has to run. You can totally crash it. But that card did not yet work for me uh, because uh, I'm facing issues with a FreeBSD driver and don't have the time to debug the um, driver because the card works by emulating a known relatively simple PCIe NIC. Uh, mm -hmm. with just, but it's not perfect from the compatibility point of view. Instead, for example, it lacks 64-bit DMA, so it has to use bounce buffering. Uh, there are Microtech upstreams a few changes, but it does not work for me. Understood. On the hardware I tested. I suspect it's not that hard to fix, but I can't promise anyone else that it's going to work for them. Oh. Uh, related, so, has yeah. anyone tried high KVM, which allows for some clever, like, uh, virtualized storage for a fake USB ISO from your Raspberry Pi, et cetera, et cetera. Um, doesn't the power edge have a virtual flush as well if you, from oh, a micro SD But card? we're talking stuff in front. I'm just curious if that one's come up. 
because, hey, I've been asking around if that could be done with FreeBSD as opposed to Linux. Anyway. It um, can be, as in FreeBSD can act as a USB device. Mm, and then you have a few different profiles, and one of them has a serial port, a USB mass storage, and a, even a virtual Ethernet mm -hmm. as the generic uh, USB classes. The slight problem is that you need hardware which can negotiate USB device mode. Okay. Or be permanently oh, wow. put into that. Uh, what do they call it? O -O on the go mode, I think it's o o USB OTG. Got it. Uh, but you need on micro USB a certain pin on USB tape type yep. A. That pin does not exist. So on a normal, then you have to set it up and use cables which are not supposed to be produced, right? Like USB A, -A to A, mail to mail. Yep. Cables. <laughs> Like the, uh, yeah. the power of my and, KVM switch? Yeah. Which kind of have been retroactively allowed because you can build the equivalent by combining loud cables. But yeah. Okay, cool. Moving on. Uh, so Santiago, some news from the Enterprise Working Group. Uh, there should be a patch for the AMD IO MMU that's been biting you in the behind for some time. Do you have any news from your cluster? My cluster. Well, your Sorry. development lab. Uh, no, no, not not really. Um, so we try a few weeks ago, as you, as I told you, but without the IOMMU, well, we expect what expect. It was crashing. Um, no, everything's fine. The people are happy with the hive and the performance. So yeah, um, not, not not many news from my side. I just continue working on the on the patch for ping and ping ping six to support uh, fifths or rooting instances, if we want to call it, uh, and that's almost done. Uh, is any of that public at this time? Um, no, I am a bit shy to show the horrible thing I did. So and you I said need... <laughs> FIBS, F-I-B-S? Yeah, FIBS, yeah, multiple routing tables, or forwarding okay. tables, yeah. Um, uh... Cool, well, uh, Godspeed. I can type uh, routing, routing tables. Okay. okay. That's correct. Yeah. Great. Keep us posted. Welcome back. Uh, always a pleasure. So let's see. Also on the jails and zones call, now that 9PFS client is arriving in 15, meaning you can spin it up on as old as a FreeBSD 13 host because the 9P server is built in. Uh, I got my fingers burned on it and experimented with it and put some docs in the free BSD Beehive wiki page. And Daniel, you looked at vert IOFS because you have some ideas of how that could work in a VM to perhaps even what, protect a ZFS and receive, uh, receive a stream by giving a layer of isolation. What did you learn about, say, vert IO console? Oh, uh, well, that's, outside, that's actually yeah. used for, that's used for, um, uh, in TrueNAS to, to communicate between, uh, the host and the guest. I have no idea what's actually happening there because I haven't u actually used, uh, TrueNAS at all. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but that's pretty good for messaging. My, Michael, didn't you do something? You, you were, you were trying to do some sending commands over, over some sort of serial console with not, uh, Beehive guests. Uh, not recently. Weren't you? I did something with like, you know, just Tmux lets you throw in commands and that's kind of handy because you're just blasting. Oh, no, that was a thousand nice. years ago. Well, this, this would be really, so anyway, you can set up a ser serial socket and then you can have them bi-directionally communicate. Now it okay. is a console though. So, uh, so that, that means that, that we're limited in terms of bandwidth and, and to ASCII basically, because if you try to send binary over it, um, there there will be serial or console signals that'll, you know, um, that'll muck it not up. Not necessarily. Hold on, let him finish. Hold on, let him finish. And before we jump into like what Z modem, uh, go ahead. Uh, what else, Daniel? And then <laughs> exactly. uh, set us straight, Jan. Uh, yeah. So I so what I did see was yeah what I did see was if I you know if I encapsulated the the um, 
you know, the socket with base 64 or something, I could send anything and, but, but it would be limited to about a megabit or maybe a megabyte um, per second. So, so not nearly fast enough to do anything fancy, but really terrific for sending, for communicating. And this is already a tested thing since it's been, uh, since it's working in, in TrueNAS, which is obviously Beehive commercial. Uh -huh. So I I can think of a million different things that we could we could use that for, um, you know, sending commands to and from uh, between the systems and stuff like that. But yeah, you know, it's pretty it's pretty easy to do. It's just a just makes the little socket that you can see from both ends. Uh, I'd love to see a list of ideas and use cases. But uh, Jan, you are itching to set us straight. How would you send say binary data over? So I'm reading your mind. Um, you can just configure the TTY to be a bit transparent. Using uh, octals, the you what able, You put the a oh. bit transparent, bit transparent, so that you. so that there are no uh, control sequences anymore, except for a virtual break condition, which I don't even know how you would encode that on the Unix socket side. Um, and wait, and then is, you is that something that we have to change in the code, or that's something we can do with the socket? That's a configuration question. Um, yeah, right. At what level? Where would uh, you set that? The guest, uh, it's the, the code opening the TTY device in the, inside the guest. So uh, VidIO console shows up like a serial port because it's an emulated serial port. It's a console. Yeah. So uh, just not one of the four traditional serial ports on a PC compatible clone. <laughs> so uh, instead, it's a VidIO device. And one of the differences is that they can uh, have a name attached to the port. And then the guest can identify that, oh, this is the port with this label. So this is you have any... COM1. This is the uh, QEMO uh, guest agent port. And then, the, for example, the QEMO guest agent will auto start uh, if you install it on FreeBSD from ports or packages. and it detects that, then it can automatically start on that and listen for that. Do you have any thoughts about why I was I was getting such an insanely low uh, speed limit on that? It looked like it was. I mean, just because uh, it was such an easy number, it looked like probably it was because it's, uh, do, it's doing it byte by byte with lots of context, which is because it's supposed to be usable as a console, so. It can't right. wait for you to type a kilobyte to then send forward that and send each every byte which is made available. Um, do you know if you have you tried on your sender to send bigger messages at the system call level? So that you, what are you? How did you measure the bandwidth? Just DD. Um, okay, so yeah. It's not, it could help if you put it in the TTY in raw mode with STTY so that the kernel doesn't do any parsing because otherwise it will pass for certain escape sequences and so on. Hmm. I wonder what configuration uh, we have It's access not intended to. to be a high bandwidth communication channel. It's right. supposed so, to be a serial port like speed. So the code is not. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's so um, yeah. I mean, if you really want to be nasty about it, you could probably use it or SCSI to come up with clever SCSI uh, devices. For example, historically there has been SCSI uh, Ethernet adapters. Oh, good lord! Yes. In uh, so uh, yeah, in theory you can. Uh, encapsulate Ethernet frames and SCSI uh, read-write commands. But I um, I don't know if anyone ever tried to push that through the come target layer. And last time I saw yeah. such a device was in my childhood on an old 68K <laughs> uh, laptop from the mid-90s. So, yep. yeah. Yep. I guess that's why Vert VertIO, VSOC, and, and other such things exist. So what? we don't have to do with such yeah. crazy hawks. Hmm? Oh, what so we don't have to do such I crazy hacks. I reached out to Emil, and he is working on vert.io uh, 
FS. Uh, oh, sorry, FS. But the so we the other. What was what did you describe as the ultimate device? Was the yeah, the last one you really have to implement in the kernel because anything else then can be a protocol on top of the uh, sockets in theory. Not that it's optimal, but we have if there's one thing we've seen time and time again that anything you can you need can be a uh, proxied over a socket right uh, either that... udp or tcp in, on top of ip or uh, with unix socket stream and datagram yeah that's what uh, i was i was looking for any any way to to do that of course networking isn't so bad so now i think we're talking about an edge case of an edge case but I don't know. I think I think the sort of secondary thing of me digging through this is the is that that um, for an IO console could really be useful for communicating back and forth, not just not just from the host to a VM, but also between VMs. In fact, uh, the Vertio console oh. um, web page actually that their their um, you know their uh, what do you call it their their example is having having VMs communicate with each other. You know, no network, just just using the um, Vertio console devices. Uh, I I have a horrible idea. Why don't you use PPP on top of the serial port? Oh yeah, that would absolutely work. <laughs> then you have the, all of the complexity, and at that point, I would ask, why don't you use a second uh, with, oh, uh, network Ethernet device? Right. Yeah. Because you have all of the complexity and then some compared to just using a link, well-known link local address. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess the the un, I mean, possibly you know, in for technically unnecessary, but but curious dream was, you know, how do I how do I with with no configuration spin up a brand new uh, Beehive VM and then shovel bits between, uh, you know, between between two systems and a socket sounded really good. Also, I was excited about the socket the idea. IPv6. Uh, yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. That, that's, because... that's, yeah, that's reasonable. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's reasonable enough. Um, yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. I think that's, if that's fine. Two, In fact, uh, you get a, a deterministic address which, because of the MAC address, right? Because so. Your, the link local, every device should have a, MAC address derived link local address to which it responds. And if it's point to point, you can even implicit, uh, address it at the old uh, posts on link address. As right. in a uh, well known link local multicast group for all hosts on link. Yeah. Uh, and you could just send to that, so you don't even have to know. You only have to know there's exactly one other node, uh, IPv6 node on this interface, uh, sorry, link with me, then you can just use link local multicast traffic. And you could even use it as an auto discovery, or you could have well known link local addresses like FE80 uh, colon colon one for the hypervisor or something, or guest agent service, so that you just know that if you and, and those are then, fully deterministic by mm -hmm. uh, by Mac, right? So because it's Slack, and exactly. Uh, the, yeah, you just have to toggle one bit in the Mac address, I think. So, but yeah, yeah, right. It's it's definitely deterministic with link local. The other hack yeah. you could do is um, you could uh, use uh, a special Mac address to signify this is this type or MAC address prefix of NIC so that the guest can even auto detect it just by saying, okay, this is this type of uh, NIC. And then it knows that this is the one it should use for the special task, but that would require having your own code in there. Yeah, but still but that code could only... even be I mean, I, I don't that. think Beehive ex uses that or uh, FreeBSD supports it, but in theory, the VidIO net uh, device model supports things like putting configuration in uh, in there so that you don't even have to use DHCP because in theory, you can 
the hypervisor can in special registers uh, say, hey, this is your first IPv4, IPv6 address, and so on. This is your default router, this is your DNS. You can basically put the that stuff in registers in air quote. Interesting. Uh, if I understand the spec correctly, but I don't think that's implemented in Beehive. What other oh, Verdio candy do we have? Michael, did you say somebody's working on Verdio FS? Even now yeah, that, that we was have... on the last call that, that that segued into, hey, you know, Doug said, hey, I think Warner mentioned something, and then Ed Mast caught the discussion and said, oh. hey, go look at this mailing list post. And then I found this repo. So I've reached out to Emil. He will hopefully join a future call and enlighten us. Yeah, I'm uh, curious about what the delta is between 9P and the 9PFS. That's exactly the um, um, Let's yeah. see some Venn diagrams, baby. So 9P uses the 9P protocol, as okay. that in the name. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, but so does VirtIO FS. true VirtFS uses me VirtIO as a communication channel for the Fuse protocol. Oh, Fuse, yes. That was the distinguishing factor. Yeah. So uh, you can get a lot closer to, or you can get to full POSIX file system semantics, uh, whereas 9P, for example, can't do sockets. Yeah, and 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 doesn't do set UID. I, can, uh, I think in theory you may even be able to use sockets, as in sockets on the host. Oh, I didn't. Did I make a bug report about the set UID? Because I thought that. Oh. Um, did Doug oh, suggest? It might yeah, be did Doug say that that could be a bug? Because because that because that happens with a with a Debian, a, a Debian guest. Um, with with the FreeBSD host as well, you can't set set UID. I, I mean, I figured I figured maybe that's just a either a limitation of of nine P or if it's a um, you know or 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 if, yeah or if it was just a security like uh, something that they insisted on. But um, but that that creates some limits to. You know how you can you, you like nine p on root. Obviously, is going to have some problems with uh, if you can't, you know, run ping as a user or something because because you don't have set UID bits. Oh, you can if you're already root. <laughs> you can do anything if you're already root. But <laughs> just joking. <laughs> okay, uh, I found it. The other problem is that um, yeah. Privilege dropping uh, and the current 9P uh, stuff do not like each other. And that's really a massive implementation. As in the FreeBSD uh, 9P VidIO client. Sorry for the guest driver. Okay. It was right under my nose. Vert IO VSOC was the question that you described as the last Vert IO driver you'll ever use. Yes. So, uh, where I'm guessing there's we none of us know of an effort on FreeBSD. Uh, no, it was mentioned know, in the paper. It was mentioned in the paper in 2019. Um, let me see. It started out as in 2013 or so. The first draft okay. of something like that was done by the Embraer, uh, and then in 2015, I think QEMO got it for uh, as implemented by Red Hat, if I remember correctly. And Patrick so Mooney. Patrick Mo yeah, oh. Patrick Mooney was writing about uh, getting uh, uh, BSOC in the future, and that's a 2019 talk at BeehiveCon. I've heard of it. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I would. I think we should reach out as a group to Patrick, to, and he sure hasn't been on a call because hey, they haven't been developer calls for a while because hey, poor John is busy, etc. So. Uh, that is something to follow up on. I will try and do that, Michael. Okay, uh, cool. Anything else related to vert IO at this point? Cool. Um, this one was kind of silly. That can wait. Uh, let's see. Uh, so Patrick Housen couldn't attend, but he didn't a follow-up 
to his previous mentions of uh, VNC being broken on TrueNAS, which he found that, hey, that behavior is under FreeBSD 13 as opposed to TrueNAS. So he's got some links here, I believe, to the issue. Let's take a peek. Oh, colors are inverted. Okay, that's not the end of the world, but that was a clear issue. And it sounds like, oh, let's see what the closure is. But let's take a look at the second one. And it's a lower number and buttons and... Ah, blue colors. Okay, close. Let's see how that close. November 22. Sorry to just grab all this and watch the beach ball. Come on, little computer. Okay. Uh, is anyone using no VNC present? He was finding that with the latest TrueNAS that was kind of broken. Closed as not planned. Okay. Not our bug. Okay, great. Uh, up, 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 up. And let's see. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, does anyone have a pony in this race? Not our I okay. want to hear more. Okay. Uh there are the links. Let's see. He didn't say much more about that. I'll put these together. So there's that. Um other topics before we uh, I'll, I'll blast a quick one out um i feel kind of dumb here it's like okay so lib archive can like decompress all the things and you can have tar expanding archives compressed with like all the things xz z standard i believe and zip you name it but then what about simply a file without an archive is there a simple front end to lib archive that says hey open up this file no more no less as far as i know no Got it. Uh, I because think on the web... it doesn't ahead. really make sense uh, to make it part of lib archive because you're not archiving anything. You're processing a single file. Uh, lib unarchive, if you will. How about that? <laughs> Which I will well, are is our lib archive only doing a one way creation or does it assist? No, with... it also extracts and reads and does a bunch of things with archives, but there is no archive here. There's just a compressed stream of a single file. There's no tar in there. There is no zip in there. There's no nothing in there. Right. But who's then what aspect is supporting the different protocols? Because I, my impression is a compression. Uh, we have a bunch of tools like uh, yeah, right. gzip, gunzip, and so on. Uh, as, except and they are basically the command you expect for that specific compression algorithm and then you have libraries yep. uh, which contain the actual compression decompression code and yep. sometimes these commands have quite um, complicated arguments because those compression algorithms can be uh, fine-tuned for example Z standard can use a custom dictionary so that you can get very good Levels. compression ratios yeah, for short yeah, messages yeah. Uh, others can make use of lots of CPU cores uh, at the same time, um, which can be good or bad, depending yeah. on if you need them for something else. So I believe... There is no universal uh, compression, decompression tool, which only does like, compression. This is true, but I'll, I'll drop in what I came up with. And this might be completely wrong. This might be- I mean, you could- I just made a simple case statement that looked at the file type and then chose the appropriate- Yeah, case. exactly. You <laughs> could play with- Yeah, okay. Basically strip down the file uh, magic uh, database to only mm -hmm. recognize the compression formats. Yep. And then run file with that custom stripped down Magic and run the right command to at least extract. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be a bit, yeah, but if you know that the ex file name suffix is correct, that also works. Okay, it's database. Good, that's actually, that points me in a new direction. I've been uh, coding away. Uh, so anyway. 
Oh boy, any topics before we possibly briefly or at length touch on the notion, the crazy, crazy notion that came up at the Enterprise Working Group call about system-wide API uh, management goodness. Uh, some folks think that the Unix model with just files and you modify the files and you know where to look and they're consistent is a great API. Others think that if it's not like some nifty rest based python -y, pythonic thing that it's just not a real system so any thoughts there either brief or lengthy why wouldn't it be virtio console <laughs> <laughs> there, that's that. what that's what well, can we steal can we who can we who can we rob and steal to find out what uh Trunaz is do was doing with it because they were using it for some sort of Post post configuration like uh, a like a VM. Could it be that um, they? Um, that I think they that was their ran... VMware tools, right? It was their supposed to be VM... a guest editions, and I yeah, don't know how far it got, and I'm surprised they in fact ended up using it because that was supposed to be all the things in like Greenhouse 10, but then not. Uh, um, one of I the say. things they could be doing is um, pretending to be another hypervisor. So that you can use the existing guest agent, for example, for uh, QEMO. And then they only support uh, a subset of the commands. I mean, I'm all about like. And the I mean, QEMO I'm an open isn't source bad, person. But it's mostly yeah, I'm, a, I'm an open lines source person. Of JSON I, uh... objects. That came up just this week of like Zen code. pretending it's Hyper-V. And I'm like, oh, God, really? OK, fine. Um, <laughs> so mind you, we're talking the entire OS, host and guest. Like if you want to hands off, administrate it from across the room, across the world, what does that API look like? I think it's just plain old sedoc and shell, but that's me. Uh, there are they, it came up on the call, which is recorded and will be public. It's like, hey, what do those modern APIs look like? Or is that just a crazy myth? Um, I would love to have my opinion. OK, Santiago, my opinion would have to oh. be a declarative and unimportant interface where I can say, I want this aspect of the system to have this state. And I want to know if something has changed. I want to be able to inspect that state. And yeah, that's about it. And of course, the important part is I need to be able to save that state in a reboot safe way. And you probably want to have split the running configuration from the uh, startup configuration, similar to uh, how switches do it, that you oh, can that have a safe mode where you only modify the running configuration and then you save that and only once you've saved, commit, whatever the terminology is you decide on, that becomes then the stored configuration. And when you reboot, you get that configuration again. Okay. Something, something similar to what, yes. yeah, something similar to what PF Sense or, or the guy from, I can't remember the name. What's the name of the Open company? Um, yeah, no, no, OpenSense. Uh, PF Sense, um, I forgot the name of the company. One second. Yeah, sure. Let me open I, okay. and find out. Netgate. Yeah. So they're using clicks on, uh, clicks on and they use netconf and that using clicks on you already have all the commit uh, running configuration. You can commit, you can roll back uh, and you get all the netconf. And I think they also have a REST API already. I mean, yep. out of Versioning the box, yeah. would also be nice. Yeah, exactly. That was the I mean, example really that came up with like Netgate and OpenSense. Uh, did you say yeah. clicks um, on? How's that spelled? Clicks on. Uh, clicks, C-L-I-X. Yep. Oh, okay. O N. Oh, I've not heard of that. Okay, cool. Uh, CLI. Okay. Yeah, that, yeah, click. Uh, yeah. yeah. Go back. Then there is something really interesting, but I, I, I think it's a self development from Juniper. They are doing it on, on, on Linux, and it's nothing like under NDA, but um, so. They have this, let's say, database that shows all the status of the system. So you can go to any aspect of the system and, and you have real time information on any changes. You can do changes. You can see how it's looking and you can walk that tree. Yeah. Um, again, I think if you do some search on the internet, you will find even demos on the, on the web. But definitely, if we want to move into corporate, 
we need something like that. I mean, how and today, how I do you finish. manage 200 CVSDs? It's a pain death. It is a pain death. So CVE handling is a bit, bit new. You said CVE handling? Uh, no, no, I mean, ha what I was saying, how you handle today, let's be realistic, how you handle 200 uh, free VSC nodes yeah. today. It's, it's, a, it's a pain. You need to do, if you don't have a group of developers doing something yeah. for you, you're, you're in problems. Hmm. Mm. Well, not, well, you can use something like Ansible pull mode. Yeah, yeah. And you can, but just... yeah. How you start yeah. VMs, you keep the VMs running. I mean, yeah, nobody okay, would okay. use that on, on top of uh, OpenStack or yeah. OpenShift. Nobody. No, no. Unless you're Netflix, yeah. <laughs> Unless you're who? Uh, un unless you're Netflix. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, do we know what they're doing for that kind of management? I don't know, man. What does that Probably mean? not that much because they have a si relatively simple, well defined use case. It only the yep, hard yep. part for them is making it fast and cheap. Yeah. And uh, remember, it's a caching appliance. Yep. As in, yep. if it fails, there's another cache. Yeah. If that fails too, at it's some point you have to hit this like, more expensive alternative. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Um, does anyone have just an example promised land where that works great, even if it's completely proprietary, be it Windows or otherwise, or their switch vendor? Is anyone happy on this topic, or is it just like they've seen slightly better? What do you mean? Like, oh, I if, mean, who gets this right? If we don't get it right, who does, and whose example can we follow? All the deployments I have seen on big telcos. Oh, are running okay. OpenStack or OpenShift, and we are talking about big data centers yeah. now running or BNF or CNF. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's a big problem for FreeBSD. Or, yeah, what maybe we can take a look what Oxide is doing. Yeah, did you say OpenCNS? Uh, oh. uh, sorry, CNF, so container, containerized network functions or VNF, virtualized network functions. Um, cool. BNF, yeah, BNF, okay. so virtual or containerized. Cool. I had not heard those terms, and maybe others haven't. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, and the. PFSense, OpenSense example definitely came up on the EWR call. So thank you for that reminder. Um, we are slowly getting there. It's all baby steps, but this is what it looks like when you have a small team and no budget or limited budgets or highly uh, yeah. siloed budgets. <laughs> Other thoughts, topics, complaints, concerns. Eric, how do you solve that problem in your ecosystem? Because as the new person, you must have all the answers, please. Yes. I God. wish I knew. What would your cute pups do in that situation? Can we see the pups? Come on, pups. Pay the pup tax. Oh, man. Their answer to everything is scratch my leg until ah. I pick them up. Okay. Or feed them or let them out. Just, just scratch. Keep scratching. Keep scratching. Whatever works, man. Whatever works. Picking them up is fine. Okay. Uh, other thoughts, questions, concerns, funny jokes, t-shirt slogans. I had a great chat with an Ampere rep, Peter, just before this call, and I'm still digesting the amazing things he said because, wow, certain workloads that are entirely pinned. It's like, okay, yeah, there's a core for everything. There's no hyper-threading. And when that matters, when it doesn't. So that was delightful because I bet you're doing that right now, Jan. What do you pin in 2024? Um. Not much because that's not really my use case right now. Okay. Um, but um, on a hypervisor, that makes total sense. And each time, basically, you you're reselling your compute, and supposedly the uh, Ampera chips also um, have um, some kind of uh, traffic shaping to the memory, so that you have fairness there and 
you can lock them down so that you're basically restricting the course you're selling as virtual machines yep. um, to only their worst case performance so that uh, basically there is no noisy neighbor problem because you're going only getting every fourth memory access cycle because there's a static round robin scheduler and the remaining bandwidth just remains unused unless everyone is running their virtual machine at full tilt. Uh, but that means that you get basically deterministic performance, which is what some people want. Right, especially when, when you are doing networking, sometimes pinning is required, especially if you have different NUMA domains. Um, so you, you want to make sure that at least those processes are running on a specific NUMA domain. Mm -hmm. So but uh, I guess you are, what you are saying is completely funny. correct, yeah. Go ahead, Santi. In the past, I have done things like pin mouse D to one core XORG to another and Ryan <laughs> to another set of cores <laughs> oh so God. that I could uh, and then compiled with, uh, gave him real time priority, the mouse D and XORG, and set it all up so that I could game while uh, Pudir was running on a desktop. Goodness. That's funny. But that's just uh... Uh, for the fun loads because uh, I was waiting for a old eight core workstation to compile. Uh, uh, and yeah, so that I had a little set UID starter script for them uh, hidden in path before so that they could start with real time priority uh, while restricting them via CPU pinning to only, even if they get real time priority, they only get real time priority on cores, which are not the primary interrupt serving cores. So yeah, not that I expect mouse D to consume a noticeable amount of CPU cycles, but if it's blocked because they are like on the run queue, where it's like half a dozen compiler uh, processes who each take a full scheduler tick, suddenly you have like a half a dozen milliseconds of um, input latency. Which... There you go. Uh, the, I... the back off people might be curious about that. Go ahead, uh, Daniel. Uh, I use uh, pinning to unhyperthread uh, VMs. Uh, it's worth. Oh, sorry. No, please. Uh, Daniel, wrap that up. And Andrew, you sounds like you might be doing the same. Oh, no, yeah, it's, just... uh... Go ahead. Oh, I, I was just saying, like, uh, you pin, you know, pin uh, block block one and pin one on the same core uh, so that you can start a beehive VM. And it'll essentially just not be hyper-threaded. So, um, um, so you can have a hyper-threaded host and then a non-hyper-threaded pinned uh, beehive. So well, uh, it's, it's worth noting that uh, Intel's moving away from hyper-threading in general. Um, we'll, yeah, see if they put them, we'll see if they put themselves out of business before then, but allegedly mm. they're trying to move away from it. Hmm. What yeah. I it's um, overrated. Let him finish, Jan. Just one sec. It's a parlor trick, eh? Okay, Jan. What would you, what would you like to say? Uh, it can also be tempting to use pinning to uh, put basically two V CPUs of one guest on the hyper threads of a single core, so that if there are any side channel attacks, the uh, VM mostly uh, attacks itself or the kernel, which is the minimum attack surface anyway. So the case that you can do something nasty from one hyper threat to the kernel, but not from the other, it's kind of, I so far I haven't seen any attack which claims to be able to do that. So um, it's a way that you can give more vCPUs without um, different VMs uh, tripping each other up. That makes any sense. Okay, gang, anything else at this time? A question. Yes, please. Is, do you are you aware of any anyone working on the um, sorry I forgot what I was gonna ask. The Virtnet um support for beehive like multi queues and those kind of things. Ah working on um, the 
will be nice now that we have BPP almost working to have a backend. So you have what? what? BPP, you said? BPP, yep. yeah. I think Tom Jones, I think it was Tom Jones, yeah. From, yeah, he's working. Mm -hmm. let, let me check. I think it was Tom Jones. Uh, I, yeah, that came up, yes. The project's been working on that. Um, yeah. So, so actually, has anyone noticed that we had the, we had this discussion, but then it got uh, broken up by people not being able to attend the next call. But uh, the retries that uh, Antronig was suffering from under, mm. I believe it was uh, Netgraph, yes. there was a setting where the driver is not auto adjusting a sys control. I will find that. And uh, that was progress. So he went from gobs of retries where it was like, like fifth. Uh, assist control going from 50 to like 40, 96, which is a bit high, but let me find that and get back to you. Here we go. Is that something that, is that, something that my script should assert? Uh, so that's a very good question. Here, let me drop into the doc. I'll put it in the chat. So uh, it was the net link. I have two max lengths, which is automatically handled, modified with most drivers, yet on the net graph device, it was only like set to 50 and have a nice day. So go ahead, Jan. <laughs> So uh, that's the um, default uh, interface queue length limit, which means that you can only enqueue up to 50 packets on that interface before it drops them because of queue overrun. Uh, most real drivers increase that a lot, but uh, the NetGraph interface driver for, or e-interface driver does not. And that's why you see that. And there is, according to the main page, no uh, control message you can send it to change it. And that's what we should change. And there should also be, uh, a, for the driver, a way to set the default, in my opinion. Oh, and key point um, that one can read from that is can, that you have to set it at boot time, which is like what really kind of sucks. It's a lot of tunable, not a yes. writable source CTL. And the source CTL is read only. And so you have to set that in loader conf to something like 2048 or 4K or something, and then reboot. And uh, afterwards, we queues long enough that congestion control works correctly. It's just that the queue is so short that, and the speed so high that, <laughs> yeah, you immediately run into lots of overruns because the latency is so low because we are talking about local traffic. Um, it's not a it's not as obvious as it would be on a real network because uh, you see the uh, TCP window collapsing with each drop uh, back to the tens of kilobytes um, because it's so bad with the short queue. But hey, for now you can just set the loader tunable reboot and uh, NetGraph gets uh, at least 10 gig. The bridge. That's nice. the message I'm trying to get to with that. So here's the review on According that. According to Antonik on his big box. Yes, on he's like passing the majority of his hardware over to a Linux VM for reasons. Um, that said, there was a review open, but it was like said it was abandoned because of reasons. Uh, Rod pointed out that 4096 is probably a bit high for your purposes. But that said, I wonder what it would take to make that dynamic as opposed to uh, a loader tunable. I know nothing. Uh, and how do you evaluate what it needs to be? Every device seems to do it in some magical way. It depends basically on the bandwidth delay product uh, you have to support. So both mm. speed and latency are, are important here. And it's the local latency. So uh, yeah, I would say just so. So what if what if I had like an ng buddy tune <laughs> that could uh, communicate internally to figure out uh, to, the to cost adjust. should be, be negligible. Uh, it's just conservative kernel programmers not wanting to bump another allocation up. Right. I would say just set the loader tunable and. One of it's below a threshold or something, if you want to. Groovy. Because it works, it just works quite suboptimal. Hmm. 
that makes sense. So the week started with this article from Stefano about uh, VXLAN and WireGuard, and various colleagues have found that quite interesting. So I invite you to read that at your leisure. I don't know if that comes up here, but anyone running Beehive or ZFS sure. is typically oh, replicating over at least a WAN or LAN or LAN or WAN. And hey, it's uh, kind of cool. I'm glad he published that. Um, it's a I need to hack, do more of that. It's a neat hack. So okay. what he does is he uh, has the bridge uh, where his the Beehive guests attach to or VNet enabled jails, and then he uh, uses a VXLAN point-to-point -point interface at Z to uh, the bridge, and then he can migrate incrementally, and the bridge will make sure the as he uh, unloads the one Beehive server to the new one while migrating guest by guest, everything gets tunneled through the uh, wire guard tunnel. So it has a lot of uh, encapsulation overhead because you're doing uh, wire guard with VXLAN and then, uh, yep. yeah. Yep. Any VXLAN? Lots of headers, VX... but... The question was... VXLAN users uh, here that, that use it in, in production? Yeah, but I've been thinking. Previously. Yeah, not on FreeBSD, you said? No. Uh, there are a lot of customers using VXLAN on data centers, but it's all accelerated NASICs and those kind of things. So. But yeah, it's quite I'm thinking let, him about... finish. let him finish, Jan, please. Go ahead, uh, <laughs> Santi, and then Daniel. No, but, but yeah, we, it depends. Cool. Yeah, we have a lot of VXLAN. Yeah. Got yeah, it. I just, uh, yeah, just to, uh, I, I, I'm looking to make my fleet a little more robust. So I was thinking that might be a nice thing to add. Yeah. So if yeah, you to, to be honest, you will through... see a lot of, oh, sorry, Jan, sorry, sorry. Okay, uh, you... Santi, then Jan, go ahead. You're, Santi, you're here so rare. Jan, so often. No. Let's hear from you, man. <laughs> no, I think we, I think we can't do it. doesn't matter. <laughs> no, um, what I was going to say. Yeah, you, you will see a lot of deployments now running eVPN over VXLAN or eVPN over whatever MPLS segment routing. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it is, it is there. Then we can debate if it's crap or not, but it's there. Right. Right. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess, I mean, I'm just going to have to practice with it to see if, you know, failing over for, you know, client networks between hosts and then between sites, like, what kind of pain and suffering is that going to cause? What kind of awesomeness is it going to cause? Uh, I guess I won't know until I try it. Yeah, and of course, when should IPsec pattern. in? Sorry. Yeah. No, I was going to say it depends on your traffic pattern. If your packets are really small, then you will suffer a lot of overhead. Yeah. Um, but if you're talking about normal internet traffic, then if you have an INX of 20, 10, uh, sorry, 1024 bytes, or 768, then the overhead is not going to be that much. If you're running a voice that we're talking 128 bytes, then your overhead is going to be a lot. Yeah. It depends on that also. Mm -hmm. It depends okay. on your so, workflow. Um, from what I've seen documented by vendors, it's expected that you use top of rack switches uh, with hardware, VXLAN, um, encapsulation, and DA encapsulation, potentially encapsulation in and de um, out again. So um, that means that the server, because the VXLAN is translated to a VLAN uh, by the switch, only sees VLAN tag Ethernet. So it's hidden for, by the switches from the actual server. So in that deployment, there is no need to have any fast and smart excellent but if you have the dumbbell network or don't uh, own and control the network then you need to do that in software mm -hmm. and one way you can get a little bit more throughput is instead of using WireGuard, you um, protect anything on the um, the excellent ports you selected with ipsec transport mode because that you love, saves you the two uh, headers in your header chain. What about, what about the headers there on IPsec? Uh, well, it saves yeah. you two. It, so the 
is this you always have an ethernet header yeah. then you have your ip and now uh, with ipsec you have then the esp so ipsec mm, header followed by the encrypted uh, udp header and payload um with why i got you have your initial Ethernet, then IP, ESP. UDP, WireGuard, then the IP, the XLAN, which is UDP based. Yeah. So you have a lot more headers to go through for each packet and a lot more per packet overhead. So you, your baby jumbo friends are not really babies anymore. So you better set that nick to two kilobyte. <laughs> Uh, MTU hmm. at that point. Just stay below a page if you don't want to run into issues with um, with outer he uh, heap fragmentation. Hmm. Uh, but, I hey, could keep up on those uh, sequences because, hey, the more we can uh, understand that, the more we can help people who just are like, why doesn't this work? And they don't teach this stuff. And mm -hmm. by the way, on that point, the article has lovely graphing. I want to point that out. And it's nice written. There we go. Look at that. Look at that. Okay, go ahead. What's yeah. that, Santi? No, that is really, really nicely written. Um, it's a mm -hmm. nice article, yeah. Okay. Uh, this has been a very good week on all these fronts. And... Uh, I will have news next week on all my crazy Imagine and Knock and BSD stuff. That's yeah. kind of my butt. But uh, yeah. Any final closing thoughts, ideas, questions, topics for next week? Themes? I have something that is not related to, to Beehive. It is to FreeBSD, and I found it quite interesting. Yes. So we have a we had a well last year we, we hired a new developer yeah and um, it was great because he didn't have any much experience on linux or FreeBSD, yeah or FreeBSD was the first time he he heard about it yeah so i played a bit uh, it's, it's a good friend and, and i said hey you, look we have a lot of linux but you're gonna do all your apps in FreeBSD. uh so we have had some hard times at the beginning because all the documentation you know it's mostly written for, for Linux. But then after a few months, I asked him, hey, now that you try FreeBSD and then you did the same projects on Linux, which one was easier? And he said, FreeBSD is straightforward. <laughs> I don't have to deal with all the crap from Linux. Uh, even that he finished writing his RC, uh, his, um, RC files. So it was a really nice experience to hear that. Um, I right. will try also to ask to, to invite him to the to the calls and uh, so he can give us his experience. He found some issues with you know some tools, Python debuggers missing or on on FreeBSD, but hey, he found around different ways of doing it. So for me, it was a, like a nice experience. He even implemented pipelines with with GitLab with FreeBSD, and he was like, yeah, this this is a way of working. Nice. So from my side of things. Um, as much as I come from a Lumos for here before a Lumos, I spent a lot of time in Linux. And I find that I am usually more annoyed when I'm under Linux. There are things that just don't seem to work quite as smoothly, despite Man, the LS. developers they have. <laughs> Man LS, command not found. <laughs> well don't you know they've eliminated man man is man you're not supposed to use man under linux what still info pages or what last i heard did they finally give up on that policy i'm using mandoc like any any adult does i don't know i'm happy to be wrong yep uh uh yeah and looking at block storage on Linux, it's like, wow, there are six commands to list your available devices and they're all terrible. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I like okay. being able to just use uh, IOSTAT for that. 
and Works Detroit's came nicely. up a few times this week and like, you know, uh, the whole theme of like, well, oh, we have an eBPF over here and it's like kind of doesn't do what we want and let's bring it to FreeBSD because we know it on Linux, but well, wait, we have local native tools and most of course. So yeah, it's- uh, On the, on the idea of, of trying to make a, uh, some kind of um, <clears throat> API to be able to, to control things, making it cross-platform, getting hard drive devices is one of the things that's probably going to be a problem because there's not really good cross compatible cross platform ways to do it on all the things that at least um, ZFS supports. Yep. So that makes me sad. In Z -Vault, how Z -Vault are exposed or well no, because in order because it's not just Lower level, it's yeah. not just that. So when you want to make a pool, you have to have some way to identify, okay, yeah. I have these devices that aren't already utilized by something so that you can make that new pool or that new VDEV. That's actually one of the things that uh, Proxmox does not cover well at all. Or disk replacement. The disk replacement too. I'm grouping that in there <laughs> cool. because they're both pretty similar problems. But uh, that kind of stuff is also messy. At least on FreeBSD, I didn't know about Solaris derived operating system where you have commands like test util, then you have cam control, then you have well, yeah others. I'm um, just getting just getting a list. I can easily pull that from. Uh, IOS and, and um, cool. I haven't thought about other ways to do it. I'm sure there are probably lower level ways I could do it. But if but, you want to do things like set the fault LED on a drive in some J board, yep, behind that, uh, that the uh, one I'm sorry, hops. Oh, the like uh, sess util blink the. Blink a blinking Blink. drive on a fancy SES aware J. Oh, is what you're saying? Yeah, I don't ever mess with that. Failure LEDs on uh, on chassis. You, <laughs> Scrub you... the pool and watch for which one's not blinking. <laughs> anyway, no, yeah, it's that's... actually easier. My my, my thing is a little Sorry. bit easier than that. Yeah. What I usually do is okay, the you... disc I want. I'll do a DD on. Right, so that's the hillbilly way, and it works. D D uh, D D uh, disk. Yeah. Output dev null. Yep. Yeah, that yeah. works unless it has uh, decided that uh, it has been removed from your disks because it has an unrecoverable yep. protocol error or something. That's but true, that is, but that's usually that's information easy in and of itself, right? Go ahead. Yeah, the, when that happens, I can just wait for there to be activity on the array, which never takes that long because it's always just the time it, it takes till it gets mm -hmm, to its But what if you have command. multiple uh, code spares in there too? Ah. Oh, does the Lumos because have you... code spare handling? Is there S fault management framework thingy or something? Um, mm -hmm. There is some spare handling, yeah. Okay. So some being able to handling of that. Um, okay, so... On my well, areas, I, I'm not actively using it though, actually for a few reasons. For starters, it would take me 10 minutes to walk here. So. Oh. <laughs> okay, uh, the weekly snapshots have landed for FreeBSD and the 15 VM image should include a 9PFS fix that related to getting a page fault on shutdown. So it, I was slow, it, it landed like Friday. It didn't make last week's snapshots, but if you're messing with 9PFS, that will make it slightly nicer. Anyway, anything else or shall we call it? Have a fantastic week. I welcome you to like, I welcome you to subscribe and I'll talk to you next week. Nice meeting y'all.